December 1918, Sinn Féin won a landslide victory in the general election. A provisional government, Dáil Éireann, was formed in January 1919. This led to the War of Independence between the IRA and British forces. The fighting lasted over two years, resulting in about 2,000 deaths. In the meantime, the Government of Ireland Act passed through the British Parliament in December 1920. It would come into effect in May 1921, partitioning Ireland and creating Northern Ireland. A truce in the War of Independence was finally agreed in July 1921, leading to the Treaty in December. Michael Collins, now Chief of Staff of the IRA, was sent to London to negotiate with the British. He was one of the signatories of the Anglo-Irish Treaty signed on the 6th of December 1921. Controversially, Eamon de Valera was not part of the delegation. After signing, Collins said, prophetically, I may have signed my death warrant. Collins argued that it was the best deal that was on offer and was a stepping stone to an all-Ireland republic. But the IRA on the anti-treaty side saw the treaty as a betrayal of everything they fought for in the War of Independence. In January 1922, after 10 days of bitter debate in the Dáil, a vote on the treaty was taken. It was narrowly approved by 64 votes in favour and 57 against. De Valera resigned as president of the Dáil. He was replaced by Arthur Griffiths. In the new provisional government, Michael Collins was effectively the Taoiseach as well as Minister for Finance. Sinn Féin, the IRA and the country were split and the threat of civil war loomed. In an attempt to avert another war, Michael Collins travelled the country appealing for unity and acceptance of the treaty. Wexford, like the rest of the country, was torn apart. It was announced that Collins planned to visit the town and hold a rally in St. Peter's Square on Sunday the 9th of April 1922. Collins was due to arrive in Wexford by train the day before, on Saturday the 8th of April. The People newspaper ran notices in their Friday edition announcing special trains into Wexford. But anti-treaty IRA activists were determined to cause disruption. There was trouble expected and in one notice issued by the Wexford Constabulary it warned the sale of intoxicating liquors to any person whatever on the day is forbidden. The train carrying Collins and his entourage steamed into Wexford train station on the Saturday night to the sounds of exploding fog signals announcing his arrival. They were met by a reception committee and as the party emerged from the station there was cheering from the large crowd that had gathered on Redmond Place. On arrival at the Talbot Hotel, Michael Collins was presented with a case of Irish-made smoking pipes, which he was known to be fond of. This was presented to him by Bridgetown nationalist Kathleen Brown, accompanied by Mary Forlong, Maeve Gregory and Mrs M O'Connor of the recently formed Common Nishirsha. This was a breakaway military group that had taken the side of the treaty and split from the anti-treaty organisation Common Naman. The following morning Collins attended 11 o'clock mass in the Franciscan Friary accompanied by the Mayor Richard Corish, local businessman JJ Stafford and others. He then called on the mother of Matthew Furlong on South Main Street. Furlong had died from injuries he received when testing a mortar in County Meath in 1920 Matthew and his brother Joseph were both members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. 
They had been called upon by Michael Collins to take part in the 1916 Rising and both fought in Jacob's factory. It was then on to Pierce's Mill Road Iron Works where he was given a tour by Philip Pierce and the foundry manager T.W. Salmon. This group photograph appeared in the local press. Collins posed with local politicians and the proprietors of the other two major foundries in the town, Selscar and Star Ironworks. Sitting in the front row among the business elite was the mayor, Richard Cornish, who had been blacklisted by all three foundries 11 years previously, following the lockout of 1911. This well-known photograph of Collins posing with a Pierce bicycle was taken that morning. The print was discovered in the drawer of a desk in Pierce's in 1967. Meanwhile, chaos ensued that morning on the railway routes and on the roads into Wexford town from Dublin, Waterford and New Ross. The special trains were disrupted by anti-treaty IRA members intent on preventing or delaying people reaching Wexford to attend Collins' speech, which was scheduled for 3 p.m. Roads were also blocked by felled trees. The train from Dublin carrying about a thousand people was forced to stop at Wooden Bridge, County Wicklow, where tracks on the bridge crossing the Avoca River had been torn up. The passengers were forced to disembark while workmen attempted to repair the damaged line. They were delayed by armed men who threw some of their tools into the river below. When a local man protested on the station platform, he was immediately surrounded by men armed with rifles and revolvers and forced to apologise on his knees. Eventually, the train continued as far as Enniscorthy, where the driver was removed from his cab by activists. A number of journalists who were travelling on the train continued their journey to Wexford in cars, encountering felled trees blocking the road they were taking. Finally reaching Wexford at around 6pm, five hours later than scheduled, the exasperated passengers had missed the public meeting. The Waterford to Rosslair train was forced to stop between Bridgetown and Killinick having encountered damaged railway tracks. Repairs were quickly carried out, but it was then discovered that telegraph wires had been cut and so the onward journey had to be cancelled. This also held up the Cork to Rosslare Express. Railway tracks on the Waterford to New Ross line were removed near Aylwardstown, causing delays. At New Ross station, the driver and stoker of the special train heading to Wexford were removed by armed men and driven a distance outside the town in a car. About 70 passengers who had purchased tickets were refunded their fares by the station master. Then word came through that the line towards Rathgarog was blocked in any event. The new Ross to Wexford road was an impassable at Arnstown by a large tree. Captain Paddy Mackey of the South Wexford Brigade, who were, who were emphatically anti-treaty, was helped by others to cut away the obstruction with saws. They drove towards Wexford carrying their implements but found no more trees blocking the route. The only special train to arrive on time for the meeting was the one coming from Gorey. The disruptions kept hundreds of people away and many townspeople, fearing trouble from the anti-treaty side, stayed away. But despite the heavy rain, sleet and even thunder and lightning, a large determined throng assembled in St Peter's Square to hear Michael Collins speak. A hundred years ago the square was an open space St Peter's Church, which once stood in the centre, was demolished after the sacking of Wexford by Cromwell in 1649 and the establishment of the new anti-Catholic regime. The church ruins were finally cleared by the corporation at the end of the, of the 1800s. The big fella and his colleagues arrived at 3pm to address the crowd. 
they were greeted by lots of cheering and shouts of up Collins while the Redmond's Town Band entertained the crowd. A platform was erected in front of Cousins Mineral Water Factory. Today the building is home to the bookshop Red Books. Collins and the other dignitaries were led by the Mayor of Wexford, Richard Corish. The foundries and other prominent businesses were represented on the stand. Kathleen Brown was among the political representatives who took their seats. The chairman, JJ Stafford, opened the meeting and appealed to the crowd to set aside their differences. He pleaded with them to embrace the treaty that Collins had signed just four months earlier. Next up was Sinn Féin TD William Sears, proprietor and editor of the Enniscorthy Echo. He was followed by the Dublin TD Professor Michael Hayes, who was Minister for Education. He also urged the people of Wexford to support the treaty. Michael Collins then ascended the steps of Cousins in the pouring rain to address the cheering crowd. With his charismatic personality, he stirred up the throng with his fiery oratory and gestures. Of the treaty, he said, Ireland would have control of all national activities. The treaty was not perfect, but they knew what it gave. The people should not surrender the bird in the hand for the charms lent by distance of the bird in the bush. Freedom is not a form of government, he went on. Ireland suffered the greatest oppression of all under the Republic of Cromwell. Was it not the presence of the British that deprived the nation of its liberty? And would their departure not restore liberty and give a chance of restoring Ireland's industries and its Gaelic life? Could not anybody understand that? Who would deny it? It is in our hands then to see that the remaining six counties also became free. That we are not completely free in all Ireland is largely due to the extent to which we are not a united people. We who made the treaty were not responsible for that. It is the departure of the British troops that matters. It is this departure that makes us free from their interference. This departure is the one indispensable factor in our freedom. We are told the treaty will not bring us peace. The treaty has already brought us peace with our British enemy. If it will not bring us peace now, it will be because there are those who do not wish it to bring us peace. Is it by civil war, by shedding the blood of our brothers, that we can win peace and freedom? This is the language of treason, not of patriotism. Our existence is threatened now and no enemy from outside ever had the power to threaten it. There is grave danger of another long agony before our country, brought on by ourselves. If we are plunged into a conflict between ourselves, we should lose that sympathy which was so great an asset in our recent struggle. But if England returns here as a result of our strife, what world sympathy will we have then? And will not England be justified in her claim that she remained here only to govern us because we were unable to do it ourselves? Next up to speak was the Mayor of Wexford, Richard Corish TD, who spoke about the general slump in trade and industrial life. He pointed to the present situation in Wexford, where practically two thirds of the people were dependent on industrial success and whose bread and butter depended on trade resumption. He said that although the treaty was not an ideal one, it was the best thing that could be got. The last to speak was Dr. Vincent White, TD, the mayor of Waterford. He said, in the present stage of Irish affairs, the issue was a free state or chaos. Today, they were, they were out fighting as plain men for the consummation of freedom 
and not for faction. The meeting concluded and the now sodden public cheered loudly and began to disperse. Shouts of, shouts of up Collins went up, mingled with some cries of up the Republic and up de Valera. Michael Collins returned to, to Dublin on the special train that had been held up at Woodenbridge earlier in the day. It departed Wexford at 8pm with its passengers who had missed the rally and proceeded cautiously. At stations en route, similar cheers went up for Collins, with some too for De Valera. Just one week after the Wexford speech, the Four Courts building in Dublin was occupied by an anti-treaty IRA garrison in a siege that lasted two months. In the meantime, a general election was held on the 16th of June. The pro-treaty parties secured the support of over three quarters of the electorate. Collins took charge as Commander-in-Chief of the pro-treaty National Army. And just 12 days later, he ordered the bombardment of the Four Courts. Two field guns belonging to the British Army who were still in the process of withdrawing from the country, were used in the attack. After 60 hours of fighting, the IRA garrison surrendered. This marked the beginning of the Civil War. On a visit to his native county Cork, Michael Collins was shot dead in an ambush by anti-treaty IRA activists on the 22nd of August. He was only 31 years of age. Collins was replaced as Commander-in-Chief of the Army by Richard Mulcahy, who was married to the Wexford-born Republican activist Min Ryan. Just eight days after Collins' visit to Wexford, Eamon de Valera, now his political rival, held rallies in Market Square in Enniscorthy and the Bullring in Wexford town. It was Easter Monday, 17th of April, 1922. There was a clear threat of civil war breaking out between the pro and anti-treaty sides. De Valera first attended a common Amman meeting in Enniscorthy's Athenium, then on to Market Square accompanied by members of the new anti-treaty IRA. In his speech he said, those who would be truest to Irish nationality would have to fight not against Britain, but against their own brothers. His entourage arrived later in the day in the bullring to a waiting crowd of about 5,000 supporters. The meeting was presided over by Wexford TD, Dr. Jim Ryan. Another speaker was Sean Etchingham, who singled out the mayor of Wexford, Richard Corish, for defending the treaty at Michael Collins' St. Peter's Square rally the previous week. De Valera asked Republicans present to be true to the men who died in 1916 and during the War of Independence. He asked those present if they would ever be satisfied before Ireland was completely free. He asked them if their consciences told them that they were not satisfied, would they be ready to suffer for their convictions, even to risk their lives. After a rendition of the soldier song, the day ended, as did Collins, with supper in the Talbot Hotel.